is glorious the ransom Good evening, folks. Sorry, I have to take a leaf out of Nigel's book. Good evening, folks. Much better. Good to know you're awake. Um, welcome to Ballycriggy this evening. Uh, it's good to see you, uh, whether you're here in person or perhaps watching online. Thank you for joining with us. And uh, 
it's, it's good to be together and uh, to worship uh, God one with another. I'm going to stand and sing uh, the first um, song or hymn, uh, Love Divine, if I've got that right, good. And uh, the guys will lead us just now. Thank you. Good singing voice tonight. That was uh, that was nice to hear. Let's just take a moment. We'll pray and ask God to be with us here this evening. Almighty God and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we uh, are, are in your house, Lord, to worship you, to sing praises to your name, to acknowledge you as God, as King, as Savior. And Lord, for those who know you as Savior, your 
your spirit lives within us. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy that you've shown to us already today. For the measure of health and strength that you've given us, Lord, we thank you and are grateful. Lord, we take a moment and think of those that are known well in our congregation who are unwell at this time. Lord, we just ask that you would be with them, you would be near them, and that they would know your comfort. Lord, that you would be a strength to them. Lord, we pray for those connected with our, our congregation who are in full-time service. Lord, we think of Henry and Beth and their work with Asia Link, for Brian and Hazel as they, they work with Faith Mission, and for Grace and Morty in England as they, they serve in Earlsfield. Lord, we, we just pray that you would keep these folks safe as they travel about. Lord, that you would just enable their, their programs that they, they pull together. Lord, looking for opportunities to reach into the communities and to organize meetings to inform and to uh, assist your church, Lord, whether that's in Ireland, in England, or across Asia. Lord, we just ask that you would bless them and that you would comfort them and keep them enthused in the work that you've given them. Lord, for our service this evening, we, we just pray that you'd be with us. As Nelson opens your word in a little while, that you would just strengthen him, that you would be uh, with him, that you would bring back everything that you have given him to say so that he can share your word with us. Lord, that we would be blessed through him. And Lord, as a servant, you would bless him. Lord, we take a moment and, and pray for Josh and Andrew as they're across in Scotland. Lord, we, we thank you just for their heart to serve, for the enthusiasm that they bring. And Lord, we miss them about the place. Lord, we just pray as that, that tent mission would uh, just be getting ready this evening. Lord, as Andrew gets ready to preach, uh, Lord, that you would be with him, that folks would gather in, Lord, we ask for folks in our own community that are unsaved to encounter you, to embrace your son as saviour. And Lord, we ask the same for that community. That as people look at their neighbours and, and, and invite them to the gospel tent mission, that folks would come, that your spirit would go ahead of them and that they would encourage to see friends and neighbours and family come to faith in Christ. Lord, for all of these things, we ask in your son's name. Amen. It is good to see you uh, this evening, and uh, I'm, I'm going to mention a couple of things, just uh, announcements that I covered this morning, um, and uh, rattle through those a little bit quicker. I mentioned Nelson while I was praying. Uh, Nelson doesn't need an introduction to us, but he is still very welcome uh, to come to the, the, I was going to say the pulpit, but the lectern this evening and open God's word, and thank you for that. And thanks also to Nigel uh, for uh, his, his ministry this morning. I think there will be tea and coffee after the service uh, this evening, round in the halls, if you want to make your way around there. Uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll, you'll get a cup of tea and uh, something in your hand. YF is on, and uh, as I mentioned this morning, Robbie is uh, taking YF this evening. And if you're in primary seven, uh, heading into first year or year eight, then you can head along uh, to YF uh, tonight as well. Just looking ahead through the rest of the week, I mentioned this morning, um, tomorrow night, uh, the kids' church program for those who've signed up to help over the summer. Um, there's an information tomorrow night at seven o'clock in the halls uh, to go over uh, the format and lessons and answer any questions you have. And if you need... Um, a, bit of a nudge with some of the, the child safeguarding, we can, we can have a go at sorting that um, tomorrow night. Tuesday and Wednesday evenings, uh, fellowship groups are on uh, at normal time and normal places, and uh, it's, a good, it's a good chance to meet folk and to share across God's word and, and to learn one from another 
and uh, this will probably bring this session to a close and th those will restart again in September. On Thursday, um, there's a coffee morning in the halls, I think that's 10 o'clock in, in the church bulletin and uh, you get a cup of coffee or tea and uh, something to eat I'm sure along with a warm welcome if you're free or you can make yourself free on Thursday morning, um, that, that's available for you. Friday morning then at the same time is one of those additional times of prayer that we put into the calendar uh, ahead of our, our gift days um, to pray for the work in Ballycraigie specifically, uh, for God's provision and, and for his help as we, we look to the future. Looking ahead then to Sunday the 19th, um, Sunday the 19th is a gift day and that's one of those, um, we have four of those uh, that tie in with our repayments to uh, the bank um, for the debt on the halls and uh, as I mentioned this morning we are grateful to God for his provision and his provision comes through you folk and we are, are thankful uh, for your giving and your sacrifice here in this place. Andrew will be speaking uh, next Sunday morning and evening and uh, then moving a little bit further the 22nd uh, will be our regular Bible study. That will be followed by a short members meeting. And uh, as I did this morning, remind church members, it is your duty to attend that and to attend to uh, the business of the church. Mentioned this prayer meeting uh, from Andy and Rachel Miller. Um, this morning, these are still out in the hall. If you want to pick one of those up, uh, you can get that. Nigel mentioned this one uh, from GMSA, and there's still... Uh, a quantity of those and if you want to pick those up and make use of them those are available in the hall for you. I think that's all of the announcements um, and uh, we're going to sing again and uh, behold the wondrous mystery. That's two in a row. I'm doing all right tonight. Thank you.
Our scripture reading this evening is again from the book of Revelation, coming to the last of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the letters to the seven churches, and the seventh and last one is in Revelation chapter 3, and it begins at verse 14, and that's the letter to the church in Laodicea. So reading there from Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14 down to the end of the chapter. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you're lukewarm, and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And we end our reading there and ask God's blessing on his word. Let's pray. Our loving God and Father in heaven, we thank thee that this evening in the latter part of this thy day, we can gather in thy house again to worship thee. We thank thee, God, our Father, for that privilege of being able to come before thee, to gather together tonight around thy word, to listen to the word of our God and Savior. And we pray, Lord, that by thy Spirit, Thou wilt take the things that we read and the things we hear and think about and apply them to our hearts. That at the close of the service, Lord, each one of us might say that we've met with Thee, we've heard Thy truth, and we've responded to it. Make us, Lord, to be not only hearers, but doers of Thy Word. We ask Thy blessing not only here, but on every other place tonight where thy word is faithfully preached. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're coming tonight to the last of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the church of Laodicea. And as we do so, we remind ourselves, I suppose, that we've gone full circle because the seven churches really formed a circle on the map, and you come right round, and you're almost back to where you started when you come to Laodicea. And it's a church in a sorry state, because it's the one church of which there was nothing good to say. Usually when you come down through the others, you find that the Lord commends something and condemns as well in varying proportions. But here, it's a bleak picture. It's a black picture. And really, there's very little, if anything, in fact, nothing that he says that's positive about them. It's the story of a lukewarm church. But the other side of the picture is that it's the story of a loving and long-suffering Savior. So it's a letter of two parts. There's the darkness of the first part, and then the brightness of that message about the, the love and the long-suffering of God. Now, 
I'm not a, a regular visitor to jeweler shops. Uh, usually I only go in to get a, a, a battery from a watch. That's about the only reason I've had to go in for many, many years. But if you do go in, and if you purchase a piece of jewelry, and you ask to be shown a particular piece of jewelry, the jeweler will often take it out, and rather than just put it on the glass counter, they'll put down a piece of blue or dark black, whatever, piece of cloth. And then they'll put the ring or the necklace or whatever on top of it. And the reason they do that is, of course, so that the, the jewel will really stand out against the blackness behind it. Stands out well. And in a sense, it's a bit like that with this passage. Because although the first part of the passage is all darkness, although it's condemnatory and critical, nevertheless, when you come to that second part, it makes it seem all the more wonderful and rich and precious. It really stands out. The brightness of the second shines out against the darkness of the first. Now, I'm going to break the, the verses tonight up into five things, and they're very simple. They're all one word each. The first thing is to look, of course, at the start of the letter, at the address. And it says there to us when we come to um, the first part of it, to uh, verse 14, that it's the letter that's been sent to the angel of the church in Laodicea. And it's worthwhile stopping just to think for a moment about the church in Laodicea and the city of Laodicea. It was a very important city. It was rich in many different ways and for many different reasons. It was rich from trade. It was rich from banking. And it was also rich because it was a, a center to which farmers came with their goods. It was a place that was wealthy. It had a significant Jewish population in it. But it was also a center for Caesar worship, part of the Roman Empire, and therefore one of the places where particularly they worshiped the Roman Caesar. They also had their own god, whose name was Asclepius. And he was the god of healing. So you can see there all the things that made it a very important city. It was a center of worship, a center of wealth, a center for business. Even its location mattered because there was a great road that led from east to west. There were other roads that crossed it, and they all met together at Laodicea. A bustling, flourishing city, a center of industry. One of the things that the farmers brought in to sell was special black wool, because they had black wool sheep in that area. And the black wool was seen as being very precious. So it was a city that was famous for all of these things. And when we come to look at the letter, all of those things will stand out in what the Lord was saying to the church in Laodicea. We've got the address there, the city. It was, as with the others in uh, what we would know as uh, Turkey. But having looked there at the, the address of the letter, the second thing we see there in that first verse is the author of the letter. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Here, the author is speaking with authority. And that authority expresses itself in these titles, as in all the other letters. The speaker, the Lord, is described in various terms. The one difference this time is that this is the one letter in which the titles of Christ are not taken from the first chapter. In all the other cases, the descriptions are lifted from chapter 1. But in this case, they come from other sources. And so there's perhaps something significant in that. Maybe it's drawing our attention to it and saying, don't rush over these things. Don't rush over them because they are descriptions 
that have something of merit for us. Jesus introduces himself to the Laodicean Christians as the amen, the faithful and true witness. And I suppose in so doing, he's saying to them that he speaks with truth and with authority because we know that he is the way, the truth and the life. You know how when he preached in uh, the time of his earthly ministry, when he was, read it in John's gospel, and again, the writer here is John, but those sayings, verily, verily, I say unto you, amen, amen, truly, truly, honestly, he's the God of truth. Because this word here, amen, is one that occurs many times in the Old Testament, um, and also in a number of places in the New Testament, one that we're very familiar with. And for some people, there are people for whom it is almost an empty utterance that they put at the end of a prayer or whatever. And it's almost a formality in saying it. It's used with little thought, perhaps tacked on at the end. But it is rich in significance. He's saying, I am the amen, I am the truth, and I am the faithful and true witness. Now, if you turn over to the end of Revelation in chapter 19 and verse 11, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And in chapter 22 and verse 6, and he said unto me, these sayings are faithful, and true. It was a contrast to the false teachers of the city, the teachers who frequented the temples and the places of worship, who had nothing of value and nothing of truth to share. And he was saying, the speaker here is faithful and true. You can rely You can really rely on what he says. And that's important because he was going to say some very hard things to them. And so before he says the hard things, he makes it absolutely clear, I am the truth. He's also said there in that he is the beginning of the creation of God. The beginning of the creation of God. Of God. The word there, and whether it's the ESV, the, the AV, or whatever, most versions translate it as the beginning of the creation of God. There are a few versions that translate it as the originator of the creation of God, because that's really what it means. It's a verse, one of two verses, and there's a connection between them, but there, it's one of two verses that the Jehovah's Witnesses use to give a false impression about the Godhead because they say Jesus is not God. He was created by God because it says there he was the beginning of the creation of God. But that's not what it means. What the original means is that he was the beginning. He was the source. He was the origin of God's creation. As we know from John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 3, And again, the same writer, John, he says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. We sing the hymn quite often, in fact, you're the word of God the Father. And there's a line at the start of the chorus that says, you're the author of creation. You're the Lord of every man. He's the author of creation. He's also the authority over creation, King of kings and Lord of lords. And so he's the maker and the ruler of everything. He's the author of creation. And so, because he's the truth, And because he's the author of creation, he is able to say these hard things 
to the people in Laodicea. Adam Clark says, by his titles, he prepares them for the humiliating and awful truths which he was about to declare and the authority in which the declaration was founded. We've got there the address and the author. And only the Son of God could say these things with integrity. And in the next few verses, 15 to 17, we have Christ's appraisal of the church. His assessment of what the church in Laodicea is like. I know thy works. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee or spit thee out of my mouth. I know thy works. Psalm 44 and verse 21, he knoweth the secrets of the heart. It's an awesome truth when you think about it, when you really think about it. He knows the secrets of the heart. He knew what they were thinking as well as what they were doing. He knew what was in their hearts and in their minds. It's an awesome truth because men often imagine that they get away with things because nobody actually sees them doing it. But there's nothing that's hidden from God. He knows all about us. He's the omniscient God, the all-knowing God. And he says, I know your works. I know all about you. And he says, when I look at you and see you there, you're lukewarm. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other. But he says, because you're lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth or spit thee out of my mouth. The word in the original there is, I, I, I know no Greek at all. I think Nigel made that point. But I, I'm one of these ones who knows. I, I just get it out of a book. And there's an excellent concordance that you can get that tells you the original meanings of the original words. So to be truthful about it with you, but the original word there is the word emeo. Now, if you get an emetic, that's where the word comes from, emetic. If somebody has been drinking something or eating something that's poisonous, they'll be given an emetic to make them sick, to get rid of the poison. It's the same word. And so it's the, in some ways, the word spew there is, is a stronger word, but the principle is exactly the same he says, I wish you were cold or hot, but you're just lukewarm. And there are some things that you drink, and they are lukewarm, and it's not very pleasant. If you're going for water, it's all right having a nice hot cup of tea or a cup of coffee. You'll take a cold drink out of the fridge, or you'll have fresh water coming out of a tap or whatever. Cold's great, hot's great. But sometimes when you make coffee... I find it anyway. And you leave it sitting for a while, and it gets to that stage where it's lukewarm, particularly if there's milk in it. I find if you drink it then, oh, it's almost nauseating. And that's really the thought there. He says, I wish you were one or the other and not simply lukewarm. There's a warning there. There's a warning there that if this church continues in the way that they are going, then disaster lies ahead. Leo Morris comments on this. He says, there's more hope for the openly antagonistic than for the coolly indifferent. Because those who are indifferent about things, they're hard to touch, they're hard to reach. They're just quite satisfied and complacent as they are. But if a person's on fire, well, that's great. And if a person is antagonistic, well, you can get into them and you've got something to work with them on. But he says, you don't even realize you have a problem. You don't see it at all. He says, because you say, I'm rich, 
increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I'm increased with goods. I've become wealthy. They were complacent because things were going well materially for them. They thought things were therefore going well. Oh, everything's fine spiritually as well. But the truth was that the spirit of the city had invaded and permeated the church. The church had become conformed, shaped like the world outside. Those we come in contact with us do influence us. Those we come in contact with can shape us. We come to accept things because we get, well, used to it. And that's the way it is. And so, we see here a church that says, well, we, we, we don't have a problem. All's going well, but it's not. You just look. I often think about uh, the city of Belfast and the number of churches that are closed. Fantastic buildings. Fantastic buildings. Beautiful buildings that vast amounts of money were spent on. And today there's nothing there. I always remember going to what was then, the, it was speak one time, in what was the largest Methodist church in Belfast many years ago. This is back in, would have been in the, in the early 70s. And it was designed and paid for by all the wealthy businessmen of the city to be what they saw almost as the cathedral of Methodism. And it held at that time, I would have guessed, about 1,500 people, capacity. And when we went there that night, there were 12 of us. And that included me, my wife, and our friend. And yet all those estates around that area, and nothing. Shortly after that, it closed. I hasten to add, not because I had spoken there. It just closed because with 12 in the congregation, you couldn't keep it going. Today, it's an art center. And so it was that you can have the finest of buildings. You can have the greatest of wealth. You can have the grandest choir in the world. But if the Lord's not in the midst of it, have nothing. He says, I want you to be one or the other. And the word that he used for hot there, the original word is the word zestos. It means a boiling point. Our word zest. A lot of our words come from these things. He wanted people who were on fire, who were passionate about their faith, who were boiling over. We used to sing the chorus, running over. Well, almost boiling over for him. But he says the reality is you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're naked, you're blind. Interesting choice of words there because all of them, well, the last three in particular, first two are quite general. You're wretched, you're miserable. You don't have the Lord in the midst. He's not at the heart of it all. You're not experiencing his power, demonstration of his power at work in your midst. You're poor, you're blind and naked. Those were actually three of the things that the city saw as being the very opposite. They said, we're wealthy. We're a wealthy city, and they were. But he says, you may be materially wealthy, but you are spiritually poor. It's the exact opposite of chapter 2 and verse 9, the church in Smyrna. He says, I know your poverty, but you're rich. So in the case of Smyrna, they were materially poor, but they were spiritually rich. In the case of Laodicea, exactly the opposite. They were spiritually poor, while they were materially rich. And in fact, the word that he uses there for poor isn't just short of a few bob. It's absolute penury. Contrast that with what the Lord has for us. Ephesians 3 and 8, it speaks about the unsearchable riches of Christ. 
The Lord gives us spiritual riches. Because when we have the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, we have his truth. We have his grace. We have his love. We have his presence. We have his salvation. We have his eternal kingdom as our eternal hope. You can't get much better than that. He says, you're poor. You're blind. One of the things about that particular medical center in the, in the city was that they had a special eye salve that they were famous for, which they used to cure blindness, or at least cure eye ailments. And so the people there would have generally thought, well, eye problems, which may have been common in the area generally, were not a problem for them. But he says, it may be all right physically, you can see, but you're blind. You can't see your plight. You can't see the problem. You can't see that you're looking for him. And naked. <laughs> a man might have the finest clothes. You might look like a, as they used to say, a model out of Burton's window. You might be dressed up in fine ecclesiastical vestments, but still be naked. And yet there in chapter 3 and verse Five, he says, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. He clothes us in the robe of his righteousness. Doesn't matter about the quality of your clothing. If you have a robe of righteousness. Here was a city whose wealth was from banking, from medical school, manufacturing the clothing from the special wool that they produced. They were prosperous. They were proud. But they were powerless as a church, and they were passionless. We saw the author. We saw the address. We see there his appraisal of the church. And then when you come down to verse 19, he makes an appeal to them. He says to them there, as many, sorry, in verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, white raiment and so on. I counsel thee to buy these of me, and as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. And then it moves into that very familiar picture of the Lord Jesus standing at the door, knocking, and he's saying, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. The Lord always knew how to speak truth in love. How to say hard things. And there are lessons to be learned for us in that. Because sometimes we do need to say hard things. We don't always say them in the best way. And he's a perfect example of how it should be done. In the other letters, yes, he condemns, but he also commends. Yet some folk, can, they can never see the good in anything. No matter what, every time you meet them, it's just a litany of criticizing this, that, or the other. They can't say a good thing about anybody. And, and when they meet somebody, that they haven't seen for a long night, they'll find one. Did I see you at? Were you there? Did you? And you almost cross the street to avoid them. They're so nice. The Lord, however, knew how to speak the truth in love, how to say hard things. We don't always get it right. I was reminded there, reading something the other day, about how many people here remember just William. Ugh. People who hand her down are the ones who are either too young or pretending to be too young. Just William was this little boy called William Brown who wore the school blazer, the school cap, the short trousers, and there was a series of these programs about him. It used to be on television, and if you were of a certain age, you would have got it every year at Christmas for a Christmas present, along with all the other things, but Just William books. They're very funny. And Just William was William Brown. And there was one of them that was called William's Truthful Christmas. He had gone to church with his family on Christmas morning, hadn't gotten much of the sermon, but he did pick up the line where the minister had said, 
cast aside all deceit and hypocrisy, speaking the truth in love. And William thought, boy, that's good. I must remember that. Speaking the truth. So they went home and they opened up their presents. And his family were staying with an aunt and uncle. And the um, uncle and aunt had given him a, a pen set and a, a tie. Um, they'd given him a book on church history as well. You know, and they, they were saying, well, isn't it a lovely present, William? Speak the truth. No. Speak the truth. No. It wasn't going well. And then later on, a neighbor calls, a very wealthy lady, who had given the family a portrait of herself as a present. I don't know why anybody would do that, but she thought as the lady of the area, it was the appropriate thing to do. The people, the common people, would have one of these in their house. And she said to William, don't you think it's very like me? And William replied, no, it's not as fat as you are. Now, that may well be true, but the point was, it wasn't the best way to say it. It says speaking the truth, but it says in love, in love. And here we see the example from the Lord Jesus about how you can speak the truth in love. Because he speaks to them of the blackness of their condition, the darkness, how appalling their condition is. They're miserable, they're wretched. But immediately, immediately, he rushes in with that offer of mercy for them. It's the appeal. Yes, we've had the darkness, now the appeal. And there we have it in verse 18. The things you need. He says, you think you're rich, but I can give you real spiritual gold tried in the fire. I can give you white raiment, robes that are washed white, the righteousness of Jesus that you can be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness doesn't appear. And I can give you eye salve so that your eyes are spiritually opened and that you see things as they really are. I can do that for you. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Those verses, that verse particular, verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now, we're all familiar with the verse. We've probably sung it sometime or other, the hymn. The old one, have you any room for Jesus? He who bore your load of sin. As you knock and ask admission, as he knocks and asks admission, will you sin or let him in? We've sung that. We're probably familiar, too, with the, the painting in St. Paul's Cathedral in London of Holman Hunt's painting of the light of the world, which depicts the Lord Jesus in front of a closed door. The door hasn't been opened for a long time. You can see the ivy growing around the side of it. The door is shut, and it's based on that verse. He's seeking admission, and he says, I want to come in and to sup with you, and the painting has the verse at the bottom of it. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, it's true of the individual, but it's also particularly in this instance, I think, applicable to a church. And that's really, the Lord is here speaking to seven different churches. And he says to this church, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I want to come into that church. But the door was closed. There are individuals, because you can apply it in that way, but particularly even churches where Jesus is really closed out. They're not really worshiping him with joy and joy of the Lord in their hearts. They're not worshiping him by studying his word. They're not preaching the scriptures. They're not doing the work of God. There's no sense of fellowship with him. His spirit is not evident in the work of the place. 
He says, I want to be in your midst. And then you'll have my spirit at work in your church. You'll teach my word. My people will bond together as a body of believers. They will want to reach out to win others for him. He says, I'm standing and I'd love to come in and have fellowship with you. Because as we fellowship here together this evening, he is in our midst. We fellowship with each other. We fellowship with him. And here we see the picture. Yes, a lukewarm church, but Jesus doesn't leave it there. He comes there as a loving and long-suffering God who shows the heart that is loving and long-suffering. And so he speaks the truth, but he brings them the love of the heart of God, Calvary love. And finally, in the last two verses, he gives them the assurance the assurance, this promise, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. Tremendous promise for God's people. It's the worst of the seven churches. And yet the most eminent of all the promises, if you go through all seven and look at the promises that are given, this one really does stand out. I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and I'm set down with my Father in heaven. The worst of the seven, and yet the most eminent of all the promises that are given to it. And it really is an astounding promise that those who know and love the Lord and are faithful to him is that promise that awaits us of life in heaven above. Leon Morris said the throne signifies royal honor and a place with Christ is the highest honor conceivable for a Christian. Sometimes the pastor speaks about the big picture and in a sense you're getting it. He's the author of creation. He was there at the beginning. From creation through to the cross and then finally to the consummation of the ages. Someday, in some way, reigning and ruling with him. What a day that will be when we meet him once more. Yes, no matter what the plight might be, whether it be in the life of an individual or in the life of a church, we have a loving and long-suffering Savior. There are many here who I'm sure we're converted when they were very young. But there'll be other folk here tonight. And maybe you've gone through many years before you got to that point where you put your trust in Christ. Or it may be that you've gone on in years and you still haven't put your trust in Christ. Then that loving and long-suffering Savior is here tonight. And as the hymn says, oh, that the world might taste and see the riches of his grace, the arms of love that compass me, would all mankind embrace. I always remember speaking many years ago to a man in a wee mission hall in the back of beyond. And he was at the meeting and he had been recently saved. And he was well into his 80s. And he'd been going to that mission hall since he was a teenager. And I started to work it out. That means he was going there for about 70 years. And there are 50-odd Sundays in the year. 
how many thousands of sermons he had heard. And it was only at the end of that time that he responded to the love of God and was thankful indeed that God is long-suffering and that he longs to draw men and women to himself. We think of that consummation there. I will overcome, sit down with my father in his throne, and they will sit with me. I was just thinking there as we sang the hymn earlier on, change from glory into glory. Till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before him, lost in wonder, love, and The heart of the message tonight is that whatever our plight, the love of God is greater. And we're going to sing our closing hymn, which is that lovely last verse, could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole stretched from sky to sky. We talk about the greatness of God's love. That verse says, no matter how you might try, you can never really express it. The height, the depth, the length, the breadth it falls beyond our understanding, beyond human comprehension, beyond human expression. But even though we may not be able to put it into words, we can experience his loving and saving grace. Let's stand to sing.
Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy word, inspired, infallible, inerrant word of God. We pray that thou wouldst deepen our understanding of it, that by thy spirit thou wouldst take what we've been thinking about tonight, apply it to our hearts, that we might never be seen to be lukewarm, but to be zealous and on fire, to be hot, to be powerful and passionate in our living for thee. And Father, we ask thy blessing upon each one here tonight. Separate us with thy blessing. We ask it in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit.